great. I think uh, I'll start as people continue joining. Uh, I want to welcome you all to this event, uh, Human Rights Violation in Canadian Immigration Detention, an Interfaith Call to Action, organized by Citizens for Public Justice and Human Rights Watch in the context of the, human, of the Welcome to Canada campaign. I am Emilio Rodriguez, I'm Policy Analyst for Refugee Rights at Citizens for Public Justice, and I'll be your host for this event. I want to begin by acknowledging the land that I'm speaking from. I am in Maple Ridge, British Columbia, which is located on the traditional territory of the Katsi First Nation and Quantum First Nations. Since we're joining from across Sordo Island, I invite us all to reflect on the land that we're joining from. Today, we gather as representatives from different faith traditions across Canada to learn about the issue of immigration detentions and explore ways to foster change. We will hear first the testimony of Amina, a woman with lived experience of immigration detention in Canada. It is important to note that Amina is a pseudonym we're using to protect her identity. After that, we will hear from Hannah Gross, a consultant at the Disability Rights Division of Human Rights Watch, who will present the main findings of the report released jointly by Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International in 2021 on this topic. Afterwards, we will hear from a panel of experts and leaders from different faith traditions who will explain how immigration detention affects human, mental health and transgresses human dignity. There will be a dedicated question and answer space after the panel, but we encourage you to add your comments and questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A function on Zoom. We will end with a summary of next steps to take action facilitated by Victoria Strang, policy advocate with faith communities at Human Rights Watch. In the meantime, for next steps, I invite you to check the links that will be shared in the chat uh, that provide more information about the campaign and ways to get involved. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Simultaneous interpretation in American Sign Language and speech to text card captioning are available. An American Sign Language interpreter will be highlighted next to the speaker at all times. We wanna thank them for, for their contribution to the session and, uh, and yeah. If, feel free to share questions or comments using the Q&A function. And I also want to uh, remind everyone that this session will be recorded and later shared with registered participants. In the interest of time, I will send a reminder to panelists to finalize their interventions when, they're, when they reach their allotted time. Uh, the session is expected to last for about one hour, but we might provide 10 additional minutes, which are optional, at the end, if we've received many questions from panelists. I wanna thank you again for your participation in this important campaign. We hope that this is a valu valuable opportunity for you to learn more and inspire action within our communities across the country. To begin, I would like to invite Amina, a woman with lived experience of immigration detention. She will not appear in camera. Amina, we sincerely thank you for being here. You can start your intervention now. Thank you so much, Emilio. Hi, everyone. My pseudonym is Amina, and I appreciate this opportunity to share my story with you. I was born in Afghanistan, and I came to Canada when I was seven, along with my parents and three siblings. In many ways, my family's story sounds like the perfect Canadian story. We found refuge in this country, and it's our home. But I've held on to this story for many years to keep it perfect, at least in my mind. But this is not what I remember from my first few days in Canada. I remember the border officers with a Canadian flag stitched to their uniforms. I remember one of them bringing us six sets of handcuffs. There was one for each of us. When they realized four of us were kids, they spared us kids, but handcuffed my parents in front of us. We were all put into the back of a truck with a heavy metal fence blocking us from the driver. I remember the barbed wire and the heavy surveillance. I remember seeing my mom handcuffed while she held my baby brother in her arms. I remember the officers taking two of my siblings and me away from our parents and putting us in a different room. I remember bright lights. I remember being hungry. I remember feeling panic. The border officers were uncooperative and aggressive. They only provided us with ham sandwiches but we couldn't eat ham, so we stayed hungry. I remember the officers telling us that they're gonna take us away from these people, 
referring to my parents as these people. I remember screaming and running out of the room and down a hallway, searching for my mom. When I found her, I remember telling her what the officers had told us, that they would take us away. I remember her trying to soothe me. I remember sleeping in that place. I remember not knowing what was happening, and I remember being scared. After we were released from detention, I remember my parents giving us a little speech. They said, you are here for a better future. Don't worry what had happened to us. We are just going to move forward. We will do our best to give you a good life. For years, we didn't talk about what had happened to us, and I tried to wipe the memories away. Even now, speaking about this, again, brings me back to my younger self, and all the emotions reemerge. I wish our story in Canada started the day we moved into our building. I wish our story was defined by the wonderful things that happened after that day. Our neighbors and friends who supported us, my teachers who encouraged me, and the diverse community that made us feel like we belonged. But our introduction to Canada set the precedent that we were not welcome and that we had in some way to prove our worthiness to remain in this country. The way we were treated, being arrested and detained, gave us the idea that we are different. Those memories still haunt us. And seeing the damage tension has done to my parents pains me even more. Those officers demonstrated to us that they had absolute authority over us and it didn't matter that we were law abiding, that we were seeking refuge, that we were just kids. Because of the way we were introduced to Canada, we have lived with a lot of uncertainty and fear for many years. Like it could all be taken away from us in an instant. In many ways, my family is still coming to terms with what had happened to us, and this is partially why I'm not appearing on camera today. We never understood why we were mistreated with such severity and cruelty. The time we spent in immigration detention changed us as a family. It changed me as well. That experience made me grow up much faster and put many new fears in my mind, fears that I didn't have the words to communicate. I'm still trying to understand and cope with that trauma. There is a lot more healing that I need to do before I can come forward as boldly as others have. Detention also shaped the way I see law enforcement and the sense of safety and security in this country. Looking back now, I realize how much my parents had to do to protect us. I had a lot of good memories from back home in Afghanistan. I never took in this idea of being in a war. My parents did a good job of concealing that part. I never saw them cry until we got to the Canadian border and we got detained. They always gave us the best. I only hope that other kids and families don't have to be introduced to Canada the way that we did. I hope that other children and newcomers don't have to spend years trying to heal. I hope they can find more compassion and kindness here and that their good memories in Canada can start from the moment they arrive here, not after they are released from detention. Thank you. Amina, thank you very much for sharing this with us. Uh, it is a huge responsibility to, to hear the story and, and we hope that through the information and the next steps shared in this session, uh, we're able to join in action to, to stop uh, these human rights abuses. Um, I, wanna, uh, I wanna introduce now Anna Gross, consultant from Human Rights Watch, uh, who will share more about the report uh, made jointly by Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International on this topic. Uh, Hannah, I think you're muted. There we go. <laughs> it had to happen at least once. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much for that, uh, Amina. We're so grateful uh, for your courage. And thank you all for, for joining us today um, in this discussion. Thank you, Emilio. Thank you, uh, Victoria, and the rest of the organizers for creating this wonderful opportunity for us. Some of the most uh, serious human rights violations happen to people who are out of sight and out of mind. Over the past decade, Canada has incarcerated tens of thousands of people in immigration detention, 
including children and people who are seeking safety, people for whom Canada represents a hope and a home. Many are forced to endure some of the most restrictive conditions of confinement in this country, and they have to do so without a countdown to a date of release. Not only are these violations of, human, of international human rights law, but they also have devastating effects on people's mental health. The immigration detention system stands in stark contradiction to the image many Canadians and people around the world have of this country as a welcoming multicultural safe haven. Amina was one of the 90 people we interviewed for the report that we published in June of last year. And in addition to uh, interviewing people with lived experience in detention, we also spoke with lawyers, academics, psychiatrists, mental health experts, as well as government officials. Our report covered a range of issues in immigration detention, which I've listed here. Um, the evidence was anchored in lived experiences of people who were incarcerated in immigration detention, and our analysis was based on international human rights law. The overarching recommendation that came out of the report is that Canada should get on the path to abolishing immigration detention and that under no circumstances should a person for immigration related reasons be treated in a punitive manner, including being incarcerated in jail. I thought I'd start with a brief overview of the immigration detention system since it's quite complex and difficult to navigate. So to start with, CBSA, the Canada Border Services Agency, can detain non-Canadian citizens, including children and refugee claimants. CBSA has sweeping police powers and an immense amount of power in the immigration detention system in particular. But it remains the only major law enforcement agency in Canada without independent civilian oversight. There are three main grounds of detention, three main reasons people may be detained. CBSA officers can detain people if they suspect that they may not show up for a refugee or immigration proceeding. And this is referred to as flight risk. It's by far the most common ground of detention. CBSA officers can also detain people if they're unsatisfied with their identity documents or if officers suspect that they pose a risk to the public. I want to emphasize that immigration detainees are incarcerated under immigration law only, not under criminal law. This means that in the very small number of cases where immigration detainees may have run into trouble with the law in the past, the criminal justice system has determined that they should not be in jail. But because they're not Canadian citizens, CBSA has the power to step in, label them a danger to the public or a flight risk and keep them incarcerated. Immigration detainees have access to regularly scheduled detention review hearings before a tribunal, but there's no maximum time limit for how long uh, immigration detainees can be held. And so they risk getting stuck in this cycle of detention review hearings for months and even years. The, the longest instance of immigration detention was 11 years, and it involved a man who appeared to have a mental health condition. CBSA could not verify his identity through government issued documents, and so they kept him incarcerated for over a decade. And I have to say that many former immigration detainees that I spoke to for this research and over the years told me that the uncertainty about how long detention would last was a defining feature of their experience in immigration detention. The notion that they just couldn't know when life was going to get back to normal. Uh, that they had no countdown to a date of release. That uncertainty can shred every last bit of hope and defense mechanism that people hold on to in immigration detention. And it can create such an intense sense of powerlessness that many people even contemplated taking their own lives. I've included some statistics here. Um, these are from CBSA. As you can see, the number of immigration detainees has increased every year from fiscal year 2016-17 until the onset of the pandemic. And it peaked at over 8,000 immigration detainees in fiscal year 2019-2020. Uh, and during these four years, the vast majority of immigration detainees, more than 80%, 
were held because authorities suspected them suspected that they may not appear for an immigration or refugee proceeding. One of CBSA's most consequential powers within the immigration detention system is that the agency has full discretion over where immigration detainees are held. From fiscal year 2016-17 uh, until the onset of the pandemic, approximately two thirds of immigration detainees were held in immigration holding centers. And these facilities uh, resemble and operate like medium security prisons uh, dedicated exclusively to uh, immigration detainees. There are three immigration holding centers across Canada in Ontario, Quebec, and BC. Every year, CBSA also incarcerates hundreds of immigration detainees in provincial jails alongside uh, criminally accused individuals who are awaiting court proceedings and criminally convicted individuals serving sentences of up to two years. Many of these provincial jails are maximum security facilities. In the year following the onset of the pandemic, authorities released immigration detainees at unprecedented rates. And that was, of course, a welcomed development. But CBSA that year relied more heavily on provincial jails to incarcerate those who remain behind bars. Uh, and in fact, the agency doubled the portion of immigration de detainees held in those facilities to 40%. The average length of detention also more than doubled during that year. Um, one question that comes up is, you know, if immigration detainees are held under federal jurisdiction, how come they are held in provincial jails? But the reason that CBSA is able to incarcerate immigration detainees in provincial jails is because the federal government has agreements and arrangements with each province to allow for this. CBSA pays at the provinces a daily rate for each detainee held in a provincial jail. And in this way, the provinces are also complicit in the human rights violations that immigration detainees endure in their facilities. And later on, uh, Victoria will, will tell you a bit more about how we've taken up this particular issue in, in our uh, latest advocacy campaign. As you can see here, this map shows the 78 provincial jails and the three immigration holding centers where immigration detainees were held over the span of three years from fiscal year 2017-18 until the onset of the pandemic. And at the bottom here, there's a quote by a person we interviewed for the report about his time in immigration detention. He said, many people have developed mental health issues in jail. Most of the time I would just lie there and I would feel my mind drifting, breathing circulated air. It's a place where you have to be very strong to avoid losing your mind and to stay the same person you were before. When I put everything together, all the pressure and being away from my wife and kids, it was very hard to take. I just prayed. Our research also found that immigration detainees who are from communities of color, and particularly detainees who are Black, appear to be incarcerated for longer periods in immigration detention, and they're often detained in provincial jails rather than immigration holding centers. Immigration detainees with mental health conditions face discrimination throughout the detention process. For example, they may be placed in solitary confinement and detained in provincial jails rather than immigration holding centers because of their mental health condition. And this was another quote I wanted to share from a person that we interviewed uh, who was detained in a jail and placed in solitary confinement uh, during his time in immigration detention. He said, I was just waiting and praying, trying to convince myself that it's not that bad. I was thinking they can't just leave me in here. I didn't feel like a human in there. I felt like a dog. The guards would just open the latch to feed me. And I'll end with this here. As I mentioned, we, we also interviewed lawyers and advocates who are fighting for the rights of uh, immigration detainees and people who are at risk of being placed in immigration detention. And one of those lawyers told me, if we truly believed that immigration detainees feel pain, anxiety, love, and hope the way we do, incarceration would not be the solution. 
This could only be the solution if we truly believe they're not as much human as we are. And with that, I'll pass it back to Emilio. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah, for this presentation. I want to point out that the full report has been now shared in the chat uh, for everyone to access it. Uh, for those that uh, have just joined, uh, we have simultaneous American Sign Language interpretation. That's also the reason why we're only having one, simul one uh, speaker with uh, the video on at the same time, so we facilitate the process. Uh, and with this, I want to also remind you that if you have any questions, uh, you can post them in the chat uh, to all panelists and, and, and hosts. You can also use the Q&A function uh, in Zoom, and we will get to those questions in the Q&A period after the panel session. Now I want to inaugurate the panel session uh, that uh, with the intervention from Reverend Dr. Karen Hamilton. She's a former General Secretary of the Canadian Council of Churches, uh, and she'll begin the panel interventions now. Thank you very much. Uh, Reverend Dr. Hamilton. Thank you very much, Emilio, and thank you to everyone who has come up with this really, really important evening and is making it happen. So Emilio has also asked us to introduce ourselves a little bit more, and you heard that I was the General Secretary of the Canadian Council of Churches for 15 years, actually. Uh, I have also had the honor, and it has been an honor and a privilege, of creating several of the national interfaith bodies in this country. And that's important to know because this is very much an interfaith evening, as has been said, and you will be hearing the perspectives of those of us from a variety of faith traditions. I've also had the quite humbling uh, honor of receiving a global award for best practices in interfaith dialogue. So it's my responsibility this evening to start us with starting this conversation by talking about the responsibility of the faith communities to engage in this very substantive, substantive issue. And I would say it's not just a responsibility for the faith communities, it's much more than that. It's an imperative. There is an imperative of all the faith communities to act. And let me quote now, everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree and no one will make them afraid for the Lord Almighty has spoken. This is a quote from the book of the prophet Micah for those of you who want to look it up chapter four, verse four, uh, a piece of holy scripture that is foundational and crucial to the Jewish and the Christian traditions, but all faith traditions have similar imperatives. And you have often heard in them phrased more, more in the language of a golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You hear it said that way more commonly. And that what I just quoted to you, that second quote comes from the Christian tradition based on the traditions of Judaism, but each faith tradition has its own version of that, of how we are called to treat others in the name of the Holy One. You can look these up. There is such a thing as the Golden Rule poster, and there are a number of ways to get that and to order it, order it online. Uh, and I think Emilio will post uh, at least some of the possibilities in the, in the chat so that you can, uh, you can indeed have that for yourselves and see the wide variety of faith traditions and how they all express that imperative to care for others. Judaism and Christianity indeed emphasize, and those are, those are the traditions I speak out of because I speak out of the Christian tradition, but it is based to a great extent on the traditions of Judaism. They have an imperative that is expressed in another kind of language. I've given you two options already, but another one is the care of the widow, the orphan, and the sojourner. That is the most vulnerable in our society. And you heard Amina express the vulnerability of children, of those who are taken into incarceration. The imperative is clear. We are all called to care for the widow, the orphan, the sojourner, the most vulnerable. And that is across all faith traditions. I have the immense privilege of knowing many who have come to this country as Syrian refugees. And when they express their gratitude for the way that they have been treated because it's a complex picture and I'm about to get into some more of the complexities. 
and that they express their gratitude for the way they have been cared for by others of other faith traditions. If you then say, but, but surely if the situations were changed, you would take as much care of others. And the response is always, of course, yes, it's imperative. It's embedded in our faith tradition. Faith communities have indeed played a crucial role in the settling of refugees in this country, which then I will finish up with by saying, then gives us an even greater imperative to protest and to speak out against the kind of immigration detention that Amira and her family, Amina and her family have experienced. And I just, small little commercial for interfaith reality. It's wonderful that this panel has Jewish, Christian and Muslim representation. And so it should, and that's wonderful. But there are many other faith traditions who are also deeply engaged in questions of immigration and refugee protection, the Baha'i community being one of them, but there are many others as well. So I, I push us to a little broader uh, interfaith reality as well. But the faith communities have been integral in the welcoming, and sometimes it has felt much more welcoming than what Amina's family experienced. And sometimes what she has experienced is very, very much the reality. And this is where the faith communities need to be pushing forward. Uh, some of the things that you might hear about in the press that are, that are fairly com commonly known and have been actually reasonably well reported in the media are such things as the private sponsorship agreement. Canada is extremely unique in that faith communities uh, actually have a template for making an agreement with the government. And so a faith community can bring uh, a refugee family or assist in the immigration processes uh, for vulnerable uh, folk who need to come to this country. And then the faith communities will take some responsibility for the financing and for the support. And generally, there are lots of sweeping generalizations in every conversation like this. Generally, people who are sponsored by a faith community uh, do very well because there's lots of support and commitment to their well being, which comes out of this imperative. We are unique in the world for that Canada and are considered a model which as I've said, so for the second time now, does not, and in fact only increases the imperative to speak out and protest the kind of unfair widespread immigration detention that we're talking about tonight. You also might hear about something called the Canada Safe Third Agreement. It hits the papers fairly often. In 2002, Canada and the United States decided to make an agreement declaring each other to be a safe country. And so therefore refugees who are wanting, are needing desperately to leave places where they are and come to Canada or the United States have to declare and ask for refugee status in the country they first arrive in. And Canada and the United States have said that each other is a safe country. Well, in Canada, the Canadian Council of Churches with its 26 member denominations representing more than 85% of the Christians in Canada, working together with Amnesty International and the Canadian Council for Refugees have said, no, the United States is actually not a safe country. As we've heard, Canada is not a safe country in many ways. Uh, but So we have uh, pursued uh, various levels of the court system to get that Canada safe third country uh, agreement overturned right now as of December 16th, 2021, the Supreme Court is looking at, at whether the agreement actually contravenes human rights for refugees and immigrants coming to this country. So stay tuned on that, watch for that. The imperative is real. I also wanna to speak to something that has been said that, that Hannah said about the lack of support and the vulnerability and the way people are left alone when they are in incarceration, there's nobody for them to talk to. There's nobody for them to tell their story to. Who can they speak to? This is a hugely important issue and it needs direct intervention and attention by the faith communities. I've also been asked to talk about ways in which, and in the few, few minutes remaining, ways in which the faith communities have already been working together for human rights and for human dignity for people which, uh, who have come to this country 
those who are the widows, the orphans, and the sojourners, and so very vulnerable. An example that comes from the Sikh community, also very engaged in refugee immigration issues, and in particular from the World Sikh Organization and their human rights lawyer. Uh, you will have heard, some of you will have heard, and this I'm sorry to say is a particular uh, relevance and, and pain for, for those who live in Quebec, uh, but there are, are um, challenges in the province of Quebec. And there was one particular challenge around the wearing of the face veil, the niqab, and that was being heard by the Quebec National Assembly. In the Sikh faith tradition, it is actually not allowed to wear a niqab to cover one's face. However, the Sikh tradition believes so firmly in the human rights of all people that the Sikh community went to the Quebec National Assembly to intervene, to speak on behalf of the wearing of the niqab for those who so choose it. Well, when they arrived, it was discovered that part of the Sikh tradition is the wearing of a kirpan or what is a small sword, very important part of the Sikh tradition. And so that meant that the Sikhs there in the delegation were not allowed into the Quebec National Assembly and the kirpan is forbidden now in the Quebec National Assembly. So no Sikh following their faith tradition can now enter that space. And they were willing, the Sikh community was willing to go forward with that and to do the best they could at what has resulted in to be being a great cost to them. Uh, so what are we willing as a faith communities to do? How do we drive forward this imperative? What cost shall we pay in order to ensure human dignity for all people, the human dignity that is called for in all faith traditions, the human dignity for all those facing immigration detention. We can be better as a country, as faith communities, we can be better and we can work together with all levels of government and civil society in order to be better. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree and no one will make them afraid. But the Lord Almighty has spoken. It's not an option for the faith communities. It's not charity. It's fundamental and foundational to all that we believe. Thank you for your attention and for listening. We go forward. Thank you very much, Reverend Dr. Hamilton, for your intervention. Uh, we will now give space uh, to Dr. Rachel Kronick, uh, who is a researcher and a psychiatrist at the Child and Adolescent uh, at the Jewish uh, General Hospital uh, and has worked with uh, in, in this report from Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. Dr. Kronick, uh, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Let me share my presentation with you. It's an honor to be with you tonight. It's an honor to be with many of you from multiple faith communities. It's an honor to be with my fellow speakers, particularly I'll say to speak alongside Amina, whose courageous voice is, is a model, despite all the barriers and the ways in which Canada tried to silence her. Um, her voice is a beacon. So thank you, Amina. I've had the great privilege um, as a researcher and child psychiatrist to conduct research in immigration detention. Um, I did this in 2011 with my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Cecile Rousseau and Dr. Janet Cleveland at McGill. They did larger work looking at adults, adult asylum seekers and the mental health impact of immigration detention. And I did a smaller qualitative piece on children and families held in immigration detention or separated because of immigration detention, trying to understand what are their lived experiences in immigration detention. And we interviewed parents. And we also, because interviews with young children would have, would have felt threatening and culturally inappropriate, um, we did sand tray interviews with young children so that through their play, we know that play is the way children 
express themselves and learn through their play, we could learn about their inner worlds and their experiences. So I'll share the results of our research by just sharing with you the stories of two families to give you some sense of what we learned, uh, which is certainly in keeping with the work uh, that, that Hannah has done in her most recent report. So this child I met in immigration detention, I'll call as a death. And she, I met her during her 30, 30 days of detention at the beginning and throughout and then after release. She and her family had fled from the Middle East where they were, where they were being persecuted for their uh, re religious alliances. And they had already had a terribly arduous migration experience and had been held in detention for three months in Mexico en route to Canada. But nonetheless, when she arrived in immigration detention, she arrived a very healthy, vibrant, uh, lovely 11 year old who already spoke multiple languages. <clears throat> And in my first interviews with her family and in the first sand play sessions I did with her, she really told a story of hope and resilience. And this is her first sand tray that she created. And you can see from the image, hopefully, you can see certainly there's there are images. I don't know if you can see my mouse. There are images of police and security and fences. And there's a kind of rigid organization to this world. But the story she told was one of hope and protection. One family lives here, they are very happy. They are free. They want to do everything. They can help have a good life. Three times they pray to God for a good life because before the country was not safe, but the people in the city, they help. And the boy with no parents goes to school and he feels happy because the country is safe. As time progressed, and as I saw her later in detention, these symbols of security, which represented initially protection, began to shift. And this corresponded with a shift in her mental state. I'm, I'm also a clinician, so I watched her psychiatric deterioration. She began to have sleeping difficulties, nightmares. She started to refuse to eat food. She would spend the majority of the day on a couch, sometimes watching TV, mostly crying or sleeping. And when she was finally released, she created a sand tray that was remarkably like that first one, which if there are clinicians in the room, we think of, of traumatic play where kids reenact the same trauma again and again. But interestingly, while many of the symbols were the same, the police cars, the fencing, the story she told was very different. This world was inflected with different meaning. She said to me, the sky was watching us so we could not go outside. These guys were watching us not to flee. These animals were watching us. We went outside, for example. If we want to go outside, we have to go with the permission of Mr. X. This is the police who was watching us everywhere. And I said to her in the interview, but what happened after this scene? And she said, I think the situation may stay the same or get worse, like it gets tougher. Instead of one person watching us, two persons will be watching us like this. And so we can see how in, in line with her psychiatric, her, her growing mental health problems in the context of the horror of the detention, that also the meaning of all these protective symbols changed. No longer did she fe feel protected by the country she had arrived in, but instead these protective images were images of danger and threat. Let me tell you next the story of Isaac and Jacob. Isaac and Jacob came to Canada with their father. They were separated from their mother. They fled separately. The family had experienced horrific adversity in their, their country of origin in East Africa. The father was actually a religious leader and a human rights advocate. And the result of his work, his human rights work, he was jailed and tortured for approximately three months. While he was in jail to torture the family more, militiamen burst into the family home and gang raped the mother in front of these preschool aged boys. 
the father was released from prison and the family fled, but were unable to flee together. So the father and boys arrived in Canada. They did not face immigration detention. And by all accounts, they actually, their resettlement began quite smoothly. The boy, one boy was in kindergarten, one in preschool. They were learning French. They were settling. Their father was managing despite everything they had been through. But then their mother arrived and she was detained on arrival. And this is actually when these boys presented to our mental health clinic in the community because the teachers were so alarmed by their changed state. One of the boys became extremely aggressive. The other was um, extremely anxious, unable to leave the side of his teacher. And they were worried about them. I interviewed the father and the boys together while the mom was in detention. And the father talked to me about what it was like taking the boys to visit the detention center. He explained to me, my sons began going to the detention center, but they cry a lot until I told them that I did not want them to go there. But they had not seen their mom for a month and a half. They knew their mom was there. It's Isaac who asked his mom, why do you not want to come home? You should come today. And Isaac was present in the interview at this moment and he, he interjected, she does not want to come. When the mom was finally released from detention and reunited with her family, I interviewed her to try and understand her experience. And this is what she said to me about the experience of being detained and having her, her young sons come to visit. My sons came to visit me. He pushed the person who was watching us at the door, the guard. He pushed him and said I was leaving with him. This hurt me. I was crying myself. I said, really, I want to suicide. I would prefer to go home, to die at home. If they want to arrest me, they'll arrest me. Here they arrested me and this tortured me again. So an important thing for, for all of us to understand is that in this case, the children were not detained themselves. They were ostensibly protected from detention. And yet we can see very clearly with this case, the grave consequences of separating even one parent from their children because of immigration detention. To give you an update, our, as I said, our research was done in 2011, but prior to the pandemic, a, a very important not-for-profit organization in Montreal, Action Refugie Montréal, documented that in 2019, at least 182 children were separated from at least one parent. And, and I note that <clears throat> When it comes to these separations, they, they have informed us that some parents missed the birth of their child while they were detained. That communication is extremely difficult. There are no direct phone lines in the refugee shelter nor in the detention center. So families are cut off from each other. And importantly, CBSA is not yet counting these separations, although they have mentioned that they would start to do so. But they're also not currently viewing separation from one parent as even being a separate as even being a separation. I'll turn now to some teaching from from my faith community. Rabbi Arthur Wasco, some of you will know, who's an activist, the founder of the Jewish Renewal Movement, and he talks about <clears throat> the text we read on Yom Kippur. And I'll read I'll read this writing aloud to you. We read from the prophet Isaiah. And his translation goes, do you think that when God called you to fast on Yom Kippur, that meant drooping your head like a bulrush, wearing sackcloth and ashes? No, it meant feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, housing the homeless, breaking the handcuffs clamped on those imprisoned by the powerful. And Rabbi Wasco goes on to say, what would happen if in many synagogues at that point, synagogues and mosques and churches and temples and faith communities, at that point in the regular ritual, groups of people went out from their religious worship spaces into the streets, chanting these passages from Isaiah 
and their religious texts, picketing a business that is stealing its workers' wages, and standing in tears at a prison notorious for its physical and psychological abuse of prisoners. And I close with, with the words of an, of an even older rabbi, Rabbi Wasco is about 85, but I quote from Pirkei Avot, from Hillel, Vim lo akshav imatai, and if not now, then when? Thank you very much, Dr. Kronick, uh, for this wonderful presentation, for all the information shared. Um, I would like to invite now the last panelist of this session, Ahmad Atia, CEO of Inclusive Strategy. Ahmad, you have the mic. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel today. I'm honored to serve on the boards of the Muslim Council of Peel, the Peel Police Services Board, and Human Rights Watch Canada. I hope to share some perspective that comes from my experiences of advocating uh, uh, as a member of the Muslim community in governance and reform in law enforcement and in the field of human rights. Of all the reasons that drive refugees to flee their homes, none is as great as fear. The fear of arbitrary detention, persecution, torture, death, rape, or ethnic cleansing. Those who are able to escape persecution have to overcome journeys of immense difficulty to come to Canada. And for vulnerable families, the image of Canada abroad is a country of hope and a country that believes in human rights for all. But for many who make it to Canada, they unfortunately are not welcomed, but instead subjected to a new chapter of fear in their lives. For years, Canada's Immigration and Refugee Protection Act has been amended to remove the humanitarian lens to refugee protection and instead focus on the national security lens resulting in increased powers for Canada's border agency to deny protection, detain refugees, and ultimately deport them. Take Abdurrahman al-Mahdi, for instance, a refugee who arrived in Canada in 2017. Before coming to Canada, Egyptian authorities had detained and tortured his father and brother-in-law, no different than thousands of Egyptians. All they had done was peacefully stand for democracy in their country and speak out against a military coup. Abdurrahman escaped because the police had issued a summons for his arrest. The CBSA detained Abdurrahman in multiple facilities for months. They continuously renewed his detention on the basis that they were going to send a CBSA liaison to Egypt to meet with the government officials there, placing his family at risk. Abdurrahman was not a security threat to Canada, yet the IRB renewed his detention with each request. And with all of this happening, Abdurrahman suffered from a hearing disability. Without his hearing aids, he was effectively deaf and can only read lips or write notes. He had to rely on CBSA officers to provide him with hearing aid batteries. And as a result, Abdurrahman spent most of his time in detention in complete silence. And during his detention, he could not communicate with his lawyer, with his wife or his children. He spent months in this condition until another person detained with him named Adam Hamdan contacted a lawyer for him who eventually arranged for his release. Today, the CBSA has successfully deemed Abdurrahman inadmissible, inadmissible to Canada and he is fighting deportation, which may, takes me to the story of Adam Hamdan. I've never met him, but his story has been widely covered in media and gives a different perspective of how immigration detention is used to persecute individuals. Adam was arrested by the RCMP for alleged online extremism. He spent two years in jail awaiting trial and in 2017, a BC Supreme Court judge acquitted him on all charges, yet he was not released. Instead, immigration officials arrested Hamden on the grounds that he posed a danger to the security of Canada. His refugee status was revoked and he was deemed inadmissible to Canada. Hamden was moved to immigration detention where he was held another two years, sometimes in solitary confinement as the CBSA took steps to deport him. University of Toronto professor Kent Roach describes Hamdan's case as a miscarriage of justice. In his opinion, when the government failed to get a conviction, it decided to go after Hamdan in immigration court where the burden of proof is far lower. Both these examples highlight the use of broad powers to infringe the rights of refugees without any independent oversight for checks and balances. We have seen a massive movement 
of Muslim refugees fleeing from violent armed conflict or authoritarian regimes in their countries. Many have come to Canada and many of these families are subjected to discrimination on arrival and immigration detention. Immigration detention particularly stigmatizes refugees who are often treated like people incarcerated for criminal offenses. The Canadian Muslim community has been calling for addressing Islamophobia and discrimination in CBSA and the refugee system for several years. From a faith perspective, in Islam, asylum is a right of anyone seeking protection. Islam obliges host societies to give asylum seekers a generous reception. The Holy Quran requires Muslims to protect refugees. Islam entitles refugees and internally displaced persons to certain rights and to humane treatment that include that all people fleeing persecution are entitled to asylum and the rights associated with that status, that measures to meet the needs of these individuals are a public duty, and that refugees should not be left vulnerable to persecution and injustice. Canadian Muslims have a faith-based responsibility to advocate for the rights of all refugees. The Holy Quran has numerous references to justice, particularly the importance of creating a just society. It speaks specifically to issues of justice surrounding asylum and refugee protection. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has said that whoever of you sees an evil, let him change it with his hand. And if he is not able to do so, then let him change it with his tongue. And if he is not able to do so, then with his heart. And that is the weakest of faith. This is a clear directive that Muslims must act to ensure fundamental rights are upheld and to impose injustice to refugees. And so Canadian Muslims, along with all Canadians from all, from all other faith groups and backgrounds, need to advocate and raise awareness for reform to the treatment of the most vulnerable people who arrive in our country. Thank you very much. Ahmad, thank you very much for your intervention, for sharing this crucial perspective I want to uh, I want to now introduce Victoria Strang, the policy advocate with Faith Communities at Human Rights Watch, who will share more information about the steps that we can take to move forward and and, and yeah action items that we can have in this campaign. Uh, Victoria was critical for the organization of, of this event and has been working hard uh, to make it a reality for months. So thank you, Victoria. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Emilio. I am delighted to be here, and those of us at Human Rights Watch are excited to be partnering with CPJ for this important event. Religious communities have been at the forefront of welcoming refugees and advocating for their rights across Canada for decades. Despite these efforts, as we've heard tonight, the Canadian government has held tens of thousands of people in immigration detention over the past decade including children. Rather than a warm welcome, many people here are met with handcuffs. Faith communities have an opportunity to come together and insist that Canada truly welcome those seeking safety or a better life in this country. Following the release of the report by Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, we launched a campaign called hashtag welcome to Canada. The campaign calls on provincial authorities to cancel their immigration detention contracts with the federal government, which currently allow for immigration detainees to be incarcerated in provincial jails. Immigration detainees are held by the federal government, but provincial leaders have an opportunity to stop the use of provincial jails to lock up immigration detainees. With this campaign, we hope to eliminate the worst conditions of immigration detention and bring into question the very foundation of immigration detention, which is the punitive treatment of those seeking refuge or a better life in Canada. The Welcome to Canada campaign went live in October and has been moving province by province across the country, starting with British Columbia. Last month, the BC government committed to conducting a review of its immigration detention contract with the federal government. Now we have recently shifted gears to Quebec and you can visit our campaign website to learn more about this as well as send an email to Quebec officials. I'm excited to report tonight that over 6,000 messages have already been sent to Quebec officials 
but there are still opportunities to send more, which you can do through our campaign website. All campaign materials, including the website, are available in French and English. In addition to targeting the provinces for their complicity in the violations taking place in immigration detention, we are also continuing our focus on federal authorities since immigration detention falls under their jurisdiction. We know that many faith organizations and houses of worship work at a local level, while others have a national focus and work across Canada. There are many ways to advocate against these abuses, both at a provincial and national level. Tonight, we are excited to announce that there are several ways you can get involved. We've already seen in the Q&A that there are a lot of questions about how people can raise awareness on this issue. So the first thing uh, attendees can do is sign on to the Welcome to Canada Interfaith Statement, which calls on the government to end human rights violations and immigration detention. We will share a link to that letter in the chat and encourage you to sign it and circulate it amongst your community. Organizations, houses of worship and individuals are all able to sign that statement and the letter will remain open for at least another week. Secondly, we have a wonderful social media toolkit that provides pre-crafted posts with images for Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Like all of our campaign materials, these are available in both English and French, and you will see a link to that toolkit in the chat. Finally, we are encouraging participants to send emails or a letter to the Federal Minister of Public Safety, Marco Mendocino, Following this event, you will receive an email with his contact information, as well as a sample email that you can use to craft your own message. I want to end by saying that this is just the beginning of this campaign, and we know that many of you will likely have other ideas or suggestions for how you can help end these human rights abuses. Please do not hesitate to reach out with ideas, action items, and other ways you would like to be involved in this important work. Emilio and I will be sure to include our contact information at the end of the event. Thank you all so much for your participation, and I look forward to connecting with many of you soon. Thank you very much, Victoria. Um, now we enter the, the question and answer period. Um, we have completed the hour that, that we had stipulated for the event, but for those that are able to stay and, and would like to, to ask questions, uh, we are allocating a few more minutes to do that. I invite now all panelists to turn on their videos and to be ready to answer the questions posed uh, by participants. I'll basically read them of the Q&A function uh, and, and pose them to a specific panelist. So. The first question is, uh, it seems that many Canadians are aware of the strict enforcement that occurs in the United States border with Mexico and the separation of children from their parents after crossing the border, but know very little about problems in our own country. We know very little about the realities that so many encounter. What can we do to raise awareness about this issue? This is the first question. And there is another one that is similar to this. It says, how do we raise this issue to the general public to increase pressure on legislatures? And for example, people who support immigration generally but have no awareness of these detentions. This, I think we can treat these two questions as combined. And I will invite first uh, Hannah to respond to this, given that she has been working with this campaign for a long time. Thank you, Emilio. And it was so uh, encouraging to, to read these questions about you know what we can do about this this system. Um, so thank you, thank you for that that curiosity. Thank you for your interest. Um, so first and foremost, I, I would invite you to um, our campaign website. Um, as Victoria mentioned, we have an ongoing campaign to call on provincial authorities to um, stop allowing immigration detainees to be held in provincial jails. Um, and this is just one part of 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 course, the issues, you know, in immigration detention, it, it would not take care of all the human rights violations that are happening in the system. But I think it would, it has the potential to have really incredible impact 
um, in, in many provinces across the country, it would virtually eliminate immigration detention. And um, so we think that there's, there's a great opportunity um, to start this conversation, to really call on provincial authorities to um, stop their complicity in, in these human rights violations. Thank you very much, Hannah. The next question um, is, it asks, uh, in addition to advocating to end migration detention in Canada, what can communities of faith do to open up new possibilities for people seeking safety to come to Canada? I will open this up for any of the three panelists that have shared tonight, uh, since all of them have experience in uh, varying degrees in this area. So I will invite one of them that feels uh, especially comfortable with this question to answer it. Okay, since nobody is, is leaping on this, let me leap on it, Emilio. So then that means that I'm leaping on it. Uh, I think there are a number of things and some of them relate to the question asked before, actually. I mentioned that the, the um, private sponsorship agreement is quite a successful one. And so that that, that can be then used. And so that, and I don't mean used in a negative way, but the success of that in the support of refugee uh, families or families, individuals coming to Canada can then be promoted uh, as a way forward and encourage many more people from faith communities uh, to participate in that, but also, also can say to the government, you know, look, and there are, there are lots of statistics and, and surveys on this, look, this is working really well. So let's, you know, boost this more and more and more and, you know, allow for more folk to come and look, we've got all these groups lined up, we're willing to sponsor them. So it's, it's something that's been very successful. So let's build on it, but we've got to, you know, talk about it. And the imperative back to the faith uh, traditions is, is people have to come forward and say, yes, you only need five people. You need the sponsorship of a faith community. Come forward, do it. Say we're willing to do that. And if the government is getting all of these requests and all of these groups are lined up willing to sponsor and care for refugees, that's a hard momentum to ignore. So that's what I would say. Also building on the, the media, and I want to just mention that too, the media, and I shouldn't say that I'm surprised, but I might say that, uh, has been very sympathetic towards uh, faith communities sponsoring refugees. So also build on that too. So if they're going to present that in a very favorable light as they are, well, then we can also raise these other concerns. You can raise the immigration detention concern and raise the fact that more people are willing to sponsor refugees. So you know, let's, let's open up the numbers and, and get the government to approve more. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Reverend. Uh, that's a great answer. I also want to invite Ahmad uh, in case you want to answer this question. Just some thoughts on the, the, the various questions that have been presented. You know, in, individuals, this is a uh, an area where, you know, pressure needs to put on, on government, uh, on our on our elected officials. So as individuals, it's important that you go and take what you've heard today and speak to kind of your members of parliament, whether federal or provincial, go to their offices and speak with them. Many of them may not even appreciate this issue, uh, but also uh, leaders in the faith communities, um, leaders of uh, places of worship often have a, a line of communication to their local representatives as well uh, through the you know, other advocacy they may be doing. So using those channels to speak to your elected officials on these issues are also important. Uh, faith communities can also help educate refugees. Often we find refugees before coming to Canada, their place of asking for how do I do it and what do I do when I, when I arrive is reaching out to a place of worship. That's kind of a space where they feel comfortable. So educating your place of worship on the how the system works uh, so that you can support refugees is important. And lastly, I'll say that when refugees come and often find themselves in immigration detention or subjected to other aspects of the refugee system that is unjust, it's because they don't have the financial ability to have a, a, a lawyer, a representative who's experienced. And so they're often uh, uh, they're, they're left to support themselves or, or have lawyers who, um, who, who don't have the experience. And so faith communities can actually help refugees who are stuck in the system to, to with getting proper representation, to getting them out of those situations. Often a good lawyer is the right way to get someone out of the system quickly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, yes, Dr. Kronick. 
I, I would actually just add, if I could, you know, in this moment of extreme social polarization that we're seeing, this is an issue, the protection of the rights of refugee claimants is an issue around which we can find real unity. It's a real opportunity. Even within our faith communities, there are divisions, but we can come together around this issue of immigration detention and protecting the rights of asylum seekers and migrants and, and children and families. And we, there are actually marvelous examples in the United States. Unfortunately, the egregious policies south of the border brought out very strong activism. Um, and, and the never again movement that brought together people from, from all, all walks of the Jewish community and other faith communities um, really, really serves in a, as an example. And I think there are levels, there are these, the, the micro levels, this individual intervention that we, that we can speak of, and then, and then uh, uh, multiple levels at which we can intervene. But it takes communities stepping up and doing as uh, Abraham Josh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said, praying with our feet. Thank you very much, Dr. Kronick. Um, I think those are very complete answers to this question about what can faith communities do. Uh, so I appreciate all the responses to this. I think we will close up with a combined question of a few technical details that, 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 um, that participants were wondering about uh, or things related to the research uh, uh, that was presented in the report. Uh, so again, I'll direct this to Hannah. Um, the first question is, uh, so are most of these people detained just because they contravened the third country rule? I'm going to combine this with the other question, which is if over 80% if over of detainees are, due to, are detained due to flight risk, why are they already considered a flight risk? What is the reason behind it? And finally, the third question is, uh, if this number exists, what percentage of refugee claimants are detained? Um, Hannah, I leave these questions with you. Thank you, Emilio, and thank you for, for all those questions. Um, so I'll start with the Safe Third Country Agreement. Um, in some cases, uh, it may be, depending on the circumstances, people may be um, detained as a result of the Safe Third Country Agreement. Um, in particular, I, I, I wanted to draw your attention back to Quebec because there are, um, in that province, there's actually the largest number of children who are uh, detained and many of those children are crossing the border at Roxton Road because of the Safe Third Country Agreement. Um, but that's not the only reason that, that people may be detained. As, as I mentioned earlier, um, CBSA officers have a great deal of discretion. Um, the, the law gives them a lot of power um, in their decisions to arrest and detain people. Um, and this really leads uh, nicely into uh, the second question, what does flight risk really mean? Um, I think that's a great question. Uh, you know, a lot of immigration detainees that I spoke to also have a really hard time with this. They, it's really hard for them to wrap their minds around what this really means. And, and from our research, you know, and from our conversations with lawyers as well, um, what's come out is that it's a really ambiguous term. So for example, um, we've, we've heard of, of situations where people have expressed a fear of being returned back to their countries of origin, perhaps because they might face persecution, risk of torture, risk of death in, the, in those countries. And the CBSA officer uh, interpreted that fear as uh, an indication that that person will not show up for deportation or for removal. And therefore, um, the, the, the officer said, well, you're a flight risk, you may not appear for, for an immigration proceeding or or a hearing, um, and therefore there are grounds to um, to arrest and detain you. Um, so those are, you know, people are put into these catch twenty two situations where, um, you know, if, if they're honest and and uh, express their fears, and that these fears are really at the foundation of their refugee claims and their their claims to remain in, in Canada and seek that protection. That very same fear is the grounds that CBSA uses to uh, to incarcerate them. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot the last question. What was it? It was about the percentage of refugee claimants uh, that oh. experienced detention. 
Right. We don't know because CBSA won't release that information. And we, we asked uh, many times uh, through access to information requests. Um, it's not clear to me whether they even uh, record that information. Um, so it's, it's really hard. It's really hard to say. Um, there's a lot, and this is not uncommon, uh, there's a lot of information that's missing. Uh, Dr. Kronick highlighted that CBSA does not collect data, for example, about how many children are separated from their parents, and that um, their understanding of what separation consists of is, is not even complete. Um, they don't consider uh, separation from one parent to, to really mean family separation. So um, that's, that's, that's not an uncommon situation that um, you know, we just don't know, we don't have access to, this, to such basic information. Um, and of course, as long as we don't have these basic facts, it's really difficult to, to conduct effective advocacy and to, to ask for meaningful change in this area. Wonderful, thank you very much, Hannah, uh, for your responses. I want to now close the event, but before that, I want to give uh, recognition to our, uh, the people that have been helping make this event uh, more accessible to all, uh, including through American Sign Language Interpretation and through closed captioning. So thank you very much, Deborah Russell, Heather Perry, that have been helping us uh, throughout this event, also to the folks that have been helping us with closed captioning, uh, and again, to all of the panelists and participants for attending this event. I think uh, I want to leave us with the call to action that the different panelists and speakers have raised. This is a topic that even people that are involved in uh, refugee rights advocacy uh, might not be aware about uh, um, and, and might lack a, a bit of uh, knowledge in the specific statistics and details. Um, so I invite us all to continue learning, to use the resources that we have provided uh, through this event and, and, and through the campaign. Um, I want to thank you all again for participating. We're really appreciative of the of the turnout. Uh, I just want to say that we do have that 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 duty, that commitment of people from diverse faith communities in this country uh, to make sure that we provide an adequate an adequate welcome to all. Uh, that the experiences that have been shared today uh, may inform our actions and uh, our advocacy within our own communities, uh, so that we can seek uh, for a change. Uh, so again, I emphasize the mechanisms for actions that we have highlighted, the interfaith statement that you can sign at our website at cpj.ca, uh, as well as the Welcome to Canada campaign that you can access through the link shared below and, and the various ways to get involved. Uh, I thank you all very much again and wish you a wonderful evening uh, wherever you are in Canada.